The worldwide solar panel market is growing at about 30% a year, with immense growth coming in Asia, Europe, and the United States. 90-95% to of those panels are made from solar-grade silicon. I find it fascinating that two of our modern world's most exciting technology sectors, semiconductors and solar, are so dependent on a single, simple slice of silicon. In this video, I want to talk about another kind of silicon wafer, those used for the solar industry. But first, the Asianometry Patreon. Early access members get to watch new videos and selected references for them before they are released to the public. It helps support the videos, and I appreciate every pledge. Thanks, and on with the show. The idea of using the sun as a power source is not new. The ancient Greeks designed their homes to capture the sun's heat during the cold winter days. In the 1700s, the Swiss scientist Horace de Saussure built a glass-insulated solar box that heated water with solar energy. In 1839, the French physicist Edmund Becquerel, at the tender age of 19, discovered the photovoltaic effect. If you expose certain materials to light, then they generated voltage and current. Edmund's son, Henri, would discover evidence of radioactivity and share the 1903 Nobel Prize in Physics with the Curies. What a legit family of physicists. Nearly a hundred years later, Russell Ohl was a materials researcher at Bell Labs working on the behavior of crystals. He was trying to use crystals to detect the presence of certain radio waves. These detectors, commonly made with silicon, are vital components for radars. However, the behavior of his crystal detectors was a bit erratic. Ohl figured that it was due to impurities. He acquired increasingly pure ingots of silicon eventually building his own furnace to do it. One of these ingots, 99.8% pure, was cut into a rod. Ohl ran a conductivity test with his oscilloscope and noticed that the rod generated a peculiar loop on the tool, indicating some form of barrier in the silicon. He figured that the silicon was still not pure enough and set that rod aside. A year later, Ohl noticed that the rod had a small crack in it and ran that oscilloscope test again. He thought that the crack might have been the reason why he saw that conductivity barrier earlier. When Ohl ran the test, he noticed that the loop's behavior suddenly changed when it was placed over a bowl of water, and again when it was exposed to a hot soldering iron. Ohl showed this phenomenon to a number of his colleagues at Bell Labs. All but one had no idea why on earth the silicon rod generated a strong current whenever it was exposed to light. As it turns out, this rod was special. It was a weird hybrid. While making the silicon ingot from which this rod was made, the two Bell Labs metallurgists cooled it rather slowly to avoid creating cracks. In doing so, the impurities already inside the silicon separated into two sections of the ingot a commercial-grade section with extra impurities, and another section with much purer silicon. So when they cut the ingot to create the rod, they inadvertently gave that rod both sections of the silicon, one at each end. The end of the rod with more impurities had extra electrons within it. The other end with the pure silicon had an excess of electron deficits or holes. Where the two ends meet, you have a barrier. This barrier structure means that electrons can only go in a certain direction from one end to another. So, when you shine light on the barrier area, the photons knock loose electrons, setting them free. The free electrons want to go somewhere. But due to the barrier already being there, they can only herd in a single certain direction across the barrier, thus creating an electric current. What Ohl had discovered was the PN barrier, now known as the PN junction. The PN junction is a fundamental building block of devices like transistors, diodes, and photovoltaic cells. In 1946, Ohl filed a U.S. patent for a light-sensitive device. This would be the ancestor for the modern solar cell. Nine years later, in 1954, another team at Bell Labs would create the silicon solar cell. The New York Times said what everyone was thinking at the time. The realization of one of mankind's most cherished dreams, the harnessing of the almost limitless energy of the sun. Today, almost every solar cell used on Earth is made from silicon. This market consolidation occurred in the 1970s as the solar market matured after the oil crises of the decade. Note the phrase, used on Earth. 
arrays made to go into space are dominated by gallium arsenide based solar cells. This is due to higher efficiencies and slower degradation rates. While the United States government has researched solar since the late 1950s, that work was in the context of space travel. From 1950 to 1970, federal R&D in Earth-based solar energy averaged less than $100,000 a year. In response to the 1973 Arab oil crisis, however, the United States in 1974 invested billions of dollars into new programs to develop oil alternatives. Amazingly, 24% of all R&D investments made by the U.S. federal government in the 47 years from 1961 to 2008 came during this short seven-year period from 1974 to 1980. This includes $4 billion into a sin fuel program that tried to make fuel from coal and oil shale, $16 billion into nuclear energy, and $2 billion into a large-scale solar energy commercialization project. The U.S. Department of Energy only wanted to back solar technologies that were quote-unquote commercially ready. Photovoltaic cells was just one of three solar technologies they backed, the other two relating to solar heating. Solar heating had seemed promising. Advocates assured the government that the technology was basically ready. Nobody said otherwise, and so they went ahead with the incentives. But evaluations later found substantial technical failures and disappointments. One 1979 evaluation found that just 104 of 238 residential solar heating projects were ever finished, and of those 104, over half were partially or totally shut down again. The report concluded that there were gross inadequacies in the system, and by the time Reagan took office in 1980, the industry was almost entirely propped up by government incentives. Reagan probably did everyone a favor here by shutting it down. U.S. government involvement in the photovoltaic industry, however, had happier effects. The technology base was much stronger, so the majority of the $450 million of allocated R&D was plowed into reducing the cost of producing and installing solar cell arrays. Looking back at it now, probably the biggest missed opportunity was on the demand side, implementing subsidies or the like to stimulate solar energy adoption in the U.S. market. Some money was allocated, but programs were not extensively implemented before Reagan started his budget cuts in 1980. Nevertheless, by then, solar cells saw great success. Sales were up, private investment was growing, and the industry was preparing to export to foreign markets. And perhaps most crucially, the industry settled upon a single, well-regarded technology base, the silicon solar cell. Semiconductor-grade silicon, sometimes also referred to as electronic-grade, requires 99.999 or 9 to 11 nines percent purity. This corresponds to one impure atom for every billion or 100 billion silicon atoms. In contrast, the silicon needed for making solar cells does not have to be so pure. Purer is better, but the industry is fine with about 99.999, six or seven nines of purity. The minimum purity required for a working solar cell is 99.9999 or four nines. The semiconductor industry can afford the additional hassle and cost of reaching those 11 nines because it is a $530 billion global industry. The wafer's purity costs make up only a small percentage of the chip's final cost, less than 1%. It's a different story for a solar-grade silicon. Roughly speaking, the potential return on investment for a solar installation depends on several factors. How much the solar module costs, measured on a dollar per square meter basis. The solar module's solar conversion efficiency, which measures the percentage of sunlight energy the module converts into electricity. The location in which it is installed. The cost at which the electricity is sold into the market. And so on. Raw silicon greatly influences this equation through the solar module's cost. 15 to 20% of the solar module's final cost derives from the cost of its raw silicon material. So the industry is not necessarily interested in finding the best performing solar cell ever, rather they want the best balance between performance and cost. This economic factor was a critical reason why the solar industry consolidated towards using silicon in the late 1970s, the reasoning at the time being that solar could sail in the wake 
of the booming semiconductor industry. The steps for making and processing silicon wafers for solar panels may be familiar to you if you saw my other video on semiconductor silicon wafers. We begin again with metallurgical or metal grade silicon, which is used for producing steel or cast iron. We make it by putting silica or sand together with charcoal into an electric arc furnace and heating the whole thing up to 1,900 degrees Celsius. Metal grade silicon is 98% pure, but still contains significant impurities like iron, aluminium, and so on. This is not pure enough for solar grade silicon, so we need additional purification. The leading way to do this is the Siemens method. Here, you synthesize trichlorosilane from the metal grade silicon. Then you distill and purify this highly explosive liquid before reacting it with hydrogen inside a chemical vapor deposition reactor to create solar grade silicon. The Siemens method remains the mainstream process for producing very pure silicon with some 90% market share. However, it also suffers from low yields, about 30%. The process deals in and creates various toxic chlorine gases, which is an environmental hazard, and it is also extremely energy intensive. Nevertheless, it remains cost effective, but mostly due to significant existing capacity rather than being necessarily more efficient. Being so simple, there are largely no more big improvements left to be made. So researchers have looked for alternate ways to produce solar grade silicon from metal grade silicon. The leading alternative is the fluidized bed reactor or the FBR method. It starts out largely the same way as the Siemens method, turning metal grade silicon into trichlorosilane. But where the Siemens method next converts that trichlorosilane directly into silicon, FBR turns it into an intermediate product called silane, the silicon analog of methane. Then we put a mixture of silane and hydrogen into a fluidized bed reactor and heat it up to about 850 degrees Celsius. Small silicon seed particles are added to the mix. The silane decomposes onto the seed particles, creating larger pure silicon granules that fall to the reactor's bottom and are collected. The process is far more energy efficient than the Siemens method, a nice plus. However, industrial scaling can be difficult to achieve. Furthermore, managing and monitoring conditions inside the reactor can be exceptionally challenging. At this point, the polysilicon is still in chunks. It needs to be turned into a crystal and cut into wafers before you can make solar cells and cell modules. You can make two types of crystals, single crystal and multi-crystal silicon. I have heard the latter referred to as polysilicon as well. Here I will add the crystal modifier to differentiate from the chunks and the crystals. Single crystals are exactly as the term goes, an unbroken single crystal all throughout the whole thing. All the atoms are bounded to four other atoms. The semiconductor industry uses single crystal silicon for their wafers, largely employing either the Chokrowski or float zone methods to produce them. The solar industry uses these methods too. Single crystal solar cells are more efficient for reasons we will discuss later, but suffer higher costs due to lower yields, expensive equipment, and longer wait times. In such a competitive industry, this is not ideal. Multi-crystals are not as neatly organized as their single crystal cousins. They are referred to as multi because they are made up of many grains. The dislocations in the resulting atomic bonds are referred to as grain boundaries. This interesting structure gives them this distinct flaky look which I think is kind of cool. Multicrystal silicon is largely produced using a method called directional solidification. We place the silicon feedstock into a coated crucible. Then we heat it up to something about 1500 degrees Celsius to create silicon melt. Then we slowly and carefully start to remove the heat from the bottom of the crucible. This can be done in a variety of ways. But an interesting one is where they use a lift to move the cooling melt through a hot and cold zone to slowly cool it. When done right, the silicon melt crystallizes into a square shaped crystal that can weigh up to a ton. Crystals made with directional solidification tend to have more defects than their single crystal cohorts. Dislocations due to thermal stress tend to have unpredictable outcomes on the panel's final solar efficiency and longevity. 
On the other hand, multi-crystal silicon is far cheaper to make, and over time, the industry has managed to reduce the defect rate and thus improve the panel's efficiency in production from just 8% in 1980 to 18% today. For these reasons, multi-crystal silicon solar cells currently dominate the industry, with some 60-70% to market share depending on what source you look at. Finally, we need to turn the crystals into ingots, make wafers out of those ingots, and turn those wafers into solar cells and modules. The crystals are cut into ingots using diamond-coated saws. For multi-crystal silicon slabs, the outsides are contaminated and have to be chopped off. I am somehow reminded of a dry-age piece of beef. Then the slicing. We take a steel wire and an abrasive slurry made up of a glycol fluid and a commercially standardized silicon carbide grit powder. You are essentially scratching the powder particles over the crystal using the wire. Modern machines can produce about 2,000 to 4,000 wafers from an ingot in a single run. Each wafer is generally about 200 to 300 microns thick. The goal is to produce as many wafers as possible with a minimum loss of silicon and powder grit, and they take it super seriously. They model everything from wire friction to slurry properties in the computer. Once we have the wafers, they are doped to create the PN barriers we talked about at the start of this video before being packaged and put together into panels. In the industry's early years, they used a slightly flawed silicon byproduct from the semiconductor wafer producers, essentially their scrap. And this was fine as long as the solar industry remained relatively small compared to semiconductors, which it was. As late as 2000, the solar industry used about 3000 metric tons of silicon. In comparison, the semiconductor industry consumed about 17,000 metric tons. This changed in the first decade of the 2000s after Europe passed new policies favoring solar energy. Very quickly, the solar industry's silicon demand volumes overtook and vastly outpaced the semiconductor industries. This boom caused shortages, forcing the industry to experiment with new ideas like slicing their wafers thinner and recycling their waste silicon. But, armed with cheap money, the polysilicon industry scaled up their capacity too fast and busted out crashing prices. By 2016, the solar industry consumed 326,000 metric tons of solar-grade silicon. This is 11 times the annual consumption of the semiconductor industry. Despite its recent near-exponential growth, the solar industry still provides less than 4% of total worldwide energy consumed. In order for solar to play a more critical role in the global energy portfolio, solar cell technologies need to get even cheaper and more efficient. This might be challenging as the industry grapples with chronic underinvestment while approaching the upper limits of solar conversion efficiency for silicon solar. Yet, silicon makes up first, second, and third place in the most commonly used solar cell installations. Technically better alternatives might exist out there in the theoretical world, but history and the market have already decided. Silicon is here to stay. Alright everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.